Hello, it's Thursday, the 23rd of July. I'm Alex Ohili, and this is Alpha Bunga Bunga, the global politics podcast at the end of the end of history. This podcast is myself, George Hoare, and Philip Cunliffe. Uh, this episode, in fact, is produced by Philip Cunliffe, um, and we're going to be talking to Julius Krein, who's the editor of American Affairs. Uh, Julius, I believe, might be the first conservative, self-described conservative, actually, we'll have to ask him that, uh, that we've had on the podcast. And we're going to be talking about uh, American Affairs, the magazine he edits, as well as American conservatism, but also broaden out into things uh, Julius has written about, about politics and class, about the need for a political and class realignment in the US, uh, and then maybe finish off uh, on some discussions about US decline. Excited about this? Very. Um, not only because it's good to um, you know, speak to somebody uh, who comes from a different political perspective, but also because American Affairs has written some of the most interesting and penetrating analyses of American and global politics about the changing political economy of class in America, which is one of the themes we'll be talking to Julius about. Um, so I'm eager to meet. I'm eager to meet um, the man behind American Affairs. Yeah, and uh, definitely one of the most interesting outlets of conservative thought at the moment. I was trying to think who else are are conservatives or self-described conservatives that I'd always be interested in reading. And probably quite a short list. Um, Ambrose Evans Pritchard on there as well, I would say. But um, I think American Affairs, yeah, is a really interesting magazine. So it'd be good to to speak to the man behind it. Well, I guess the interesting thing precisely about it is that it doesn't just publish self-described conservatives. Yeah. Um, in fact, many leftists, Marxists, um, have featured in there in recent uh, recent months. In fact, uh, we had uh, Angela Nagel and uh, Michael Tracy on, who uh, wrote that piece about Bernie's failure. Um, so anyway, they're publishing good stuff, and I'm also eager to talk to him. And we're going to talk to him now. Well, welcome to the welcome to the pod, Julius. Thank you very much. So um, before we discuss your article on class in a little more depth, um, to start us off, could you tell us and our listeners a little bit about yourself, your career to date, and how you came to establish American affairs in the first place? I mean, I, I prefer actually to maintain a sort of Stalinist cult of the leader, um, where my bio just gets made up uh, to fit whatever circumstances it needs to. But uh I think it's, I've, well, what, I've, I've you, you have to decide what these circumstances are then, and, and make exactly, them yeah, yeah. I, I've given this uh, spiel a few times, but um, American Affairs was started entirely, almost entirely by accident. Um, I was working in finance. A few of my friends, also mostly in finance, um, ended up sort of all independently, but more or less simultaneously, coming to the conclusion sometime in 2015 that Trump's primary run in the Republican Party was serious, that he had a chance to win, that he was touching on real issues, uh, and so on. Uh, And we actually wrote a few articles um, for some of our friends and sort of Republican media outlets and so on. And initially they published them. And then when Trump remained in the lead, they didn't want them anymore. And uh, sort of in a, you know, fit of uh, revenge, we decided we were going to start this uh, little, silly little anonymous blog called the Journal of American Greatness, um, figuring that maybe a hundred of our friends would read it and that would be fun. Uh, and it ended up being becoming remarkably popular uh, and was cited all over and, you know, had, I think at one point it got up to like a hundred thousand views a day or something like that uh, for this little blogspot.com blog. Uh, in any event, sort of proved the concept. It actually reached a point where everyone thought they were going to lose their jobs. Um, we shut the blog down but decided we wanted to do something uh, more substantial going forward and right under our own names and that sort of thing. At the time, the view was, well, Trump's going to lose and there's going to be a big fight in the Republican Party uh, over what the future is. That, of course, ended up situation of being completely different when Trump won. Um, but nevertheless, uh, we did start the quarterly journal. Uh, and that's sort of the bizarre story of how it all all happened. Um, and you studied with Harvey Mansfield, um, according at least according to your um, Wikipedia bio. I don't know if that's the Stalinist version or another version. Um, 
The Mansfield, I gather, is a Harvard Strassi and he was taught a fair few American conservatives. I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about that and whether or not your undergraduate in education, how far it was actually influential on your thinking as a conservative. Yeah, um, I mean, my Wikipedia entry is surprisingly wrong. Um, but, (laughs) but that part of it is correct. I did, I did study with Harvey Mansfield, though. I would actually say that my undergraduate education had a very limited impact on, on my, you know, political, you know, political views as they are now. Um, I think that there's a huge bias among academics in particular to imagine that everyone's views have to be shaped by what you read and who you studied with. Uh, but for me, it was actually, a combination of experiences. One, I spent some time in Afghanistan uh, as basically a subcontractor for the Department of Defense when they were trying to get investment, foreign investment into Afghanistan. And then two, just in general, uh, working for various hedge funds uh, and so on in my experience and seeing how, um, you know, capitalism in quotation marks was actually working in the real world. And, and how actually how little of it uh, seemed to make sense and, and how dependent it was uh, really for a time entirely on uh, offshoring everything to China, taking the cost savings and doing share buybacks and that sort of thing. Uh, it was these experiences more than anything that actually shaped my views, though I would say, you know, having some background in political theory, history, so on, did give me a, you know, a vocabulary within which to sort of schematize these experiences. But um, it was the experiences themselves far more than, you know, formal education, I think, that has led me to the views I have today. You're breaking my heart here. I was hoping that my I might have the possibility of influencing some of my students at least, <laughs> but there you go. Could you, could you just quickly maybe tell us a little bit about how Afghanistan specifically shaped your thinking? Um. I mean, it's a very, the, the huge and very obvious disconnect between what was being described in D.C. and in the U.S. media versus the reality um, on the ground and the incompetence you saw and basically how all of these, virtually every one of these aid and development projects um, failed. And they were all more or less designed entirely to, to benefit um, a small group of people in the development community in D.C. Uh, it was really a stimulus program for Northern Virginia more than anything. Um, and just sort of experiencing that firsthand, as well as seeing, you know, in the project I was on uh, mostly, there was a, a tremendous amount of um, cognitive dissonance. I mean, they, they brought in people like uh, Google and IBM to make what you know, they they called uh, an ICT incubator in Herat, Afghanistan. Um, <laughs> oh my God! And and their their <laughs> slogan on the whole thing was you know we're going to uh, we're going to build a, a new Mumbai, you know, in Afghanistan, which um, you know what this is a place where the literacy rate was you know under fifty percent. Um, there was no grid electricity. Internet was actually being brought in from Iran at something like the cost of $1,000 per megabyte per second. Uh, and, and they basically, it was a bunch of uh, the children of the Afghan warlords would come into this ICT incubator and, and basically use it to watch pornography. Because it's the only internet in Afghanistan fast enough to watch video at the time anyway. Um, so anyway, it, it, was, it, was, you know, it was a fascinating experience. It definitely... Uh, definitely led me to rethink maybe some of the assumptions that uh, had been propagated by the media and so on. Yeah. Um, hi, Jesus. It's George here. That, that's a very uh, strange, but fascinating tale. Um, so just, to, I guess, to move on to American affairs itself, um, it's kind of a standing in-house joke on the pod that the journal is the most um, left-wing um, well, out there pretty much because it so consistently focuses on material and class um, based analysis. I mean, in the last episode, um, sorry, in the last issue of the the journal, there was David Adler, Joel Kotkin, Angela Nagel, Michael Tracy, Thomas Fatsy, all of whom have been um, uh, guests on on this this podcast. 
So I guess the, the question then is, where do you see American affairs sitting in the landscape of American conservative politics? Um, I guess to take a step back, and I think if you, you know, you mentioned those names, I think at this point, if you go through the whole archive online, you know, the authorship is about, you know, it's probably like 55, 45 kind of left, left wing backgrounds and right wing backgrounds, um, you know, very close and, and perhaps surprisingly or unusually in the current media landscape the the readership, as far as I can tell, is, is also, you know, very close to evenly divided left and right. Uh, but I suppose the way I think about it is that I don't, uh, the, the sort of left, right categorization just has no meaning for me. Uh, I don't think, I don't take it seriously. Uh, it doesn't matter. I don't really care about it. That's not to say that I don't have, mm. you know, I'm not pretending to be some kind of enlightenment neutrality or whatever. But the biases and the commitments that I have, uh, I mean, I'm pretty much a sort of communitarian on economics as well as on, say, society and culture. Uh, and so the left-right dichotomy doesn't actually match where I see the real divides uh, in politics or in ideology. And so I look to find people that can uh, and publish people that are interested in, you know, these fundamental economic and political questions from this sort of perspective. And the fact is that ends up cutting across the left-right dichotomy um, right. and naturally just lends to a sort of uh, treating it with as, as fairly irrelevant. Right. So I guess following on from that, what, what, are you, what are you trying to achieve then with American politics, um, American affairs? Where do you see the political project as, as leading? I think, you know, beginning, it really started from the recognition that um, conventional politics or really all politics in the United States had totally missed the major issues um, of the last, you know, call it since the end of the Cold War. Uh, and that's really what a lot, what gave Trump an opening to win. And it's what led to all this confusion both on the political electoral map after he won, as well as on the sort of policy side, um, when there was just a sense of no one had any idea what to do. And as people thought about it, they recognized that the, they really had no idea what the problems really were. And once they recognized the problems, they had no idea uh, what to really do about it, except sort of recycle these old sort of policy programs that didn't really make any sense. Um, so the first you know aim that we attempted to do is actually just sort of address a lot of these questions. For example, the deindustrialization of the United States, um, the, you know, in itself, the kind of meaninglessness of the, the left-right uh, ideological coordinates, uh, the, the collapse of any common culture or possibility for any civic political unity or meaning, um, as well as, you know, more specific matters like trade policy and financialization and uh, labor policy and all of that, that had either been totally ignored or still treated in a kind of, you know, a 1970s framework or even earlier. Right. Uh, in terms of, you know, initially, you know, I think there was um, some hope that, you know, it would influence the administration and that sort of thing. Um, over time, I would say it's actually gotten, you know, insofar as it has political influence, it's been uh, in a kind of diverse and eclectic group of people in the Senate and Congress. Uh, and, and I think it's been the most influential on some of the um, less public uh, or questions that get less media attention. For example, there's a lot of stuff on, you know, subsidizing semiconductor manufacturing and, you know, industrial mm -hmm. policy and R&D and all these questions that, you know, don't really get a lot of airtime and don't inspire, you know, protests or whatever, um, but which I think will ultimately be very important in terms of shaping the fundamental economic environment going forward. Yeah, definitely. So I wanted to pick up a bit more on U.S. conservatism specifically. And you famously came out as regretting your casting your vote for Trump. 
So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit about what drew you to Trumpian politics in the first place and how your thinking on Trump evolved and what prompted that shift in perspective. Yeah, I mean, what I regret most at this point is that no one has, or fewer, far fewer people have read anything else I've ever written than that one headline, um, <laughs> which is quite annoying. Though I, I, you know, I stand by everything I said in that article. Um, but I mean, my my personal view is that elections are vastly the the importance of of elections is vastly overestimated, um, and I'm far more interested in kind of the underlying material and and other other issues. So it was very easy for me to write that piece because I never cared that much about Trump to begin with. Uh, and when the New York Times asked me to do it, it was like, well, I you know I do think what he was doing in the aftermath of Charlottesville was stupid, and this is a great time to uh, mention that as well as promote some of these other things. Um, but uh, initially, I think, you know, my, if you go back to the blog, I think there was actually always a lot of, a fair amount of skepticism about Trump personally, though we thought it was, it was the, the general shakeup and, and, you know, sort of challenge he was making to the status quo was a good thing. And I would stand by that. Um, there was also a sense early on some of the initial appointments, there was at least a lot of hope that, you know, a lot of our friends would be in the administration and they were really interested in pursuing, you know, some of this, this realignment type of project, uh, doing things outside the kind of conventional Republican policy agenda yeah. and really focusing on industrial policy and that sort of stuff. Um, for the most part, none of that ever materialized. Um, and what, you know, when it was very clear that that was never going to happen uh, under Trump, you know, I, it really didn't bother me to uh, to criticize Trump publicly. Um, Sorry, just to just to jump in there. Um, would you agree with somebody like Nancy Fraser, who says that essentially Trump had a, a very different campaigning mode to a kind of um, mode of, you know, governance, a, a kind of much more regressive populist um kind of mode of governance and and a lot more of a a kind of um commu maybe communitarian or appeal to working class interests in the campaign so it's almost that there was a bit of a bait and switch um more than a continuity in in what he was i guess essentially selling to the american public i think that's true i mean i think it, it it's very hard to sort of intellectualize trump in any way because fundamentally for reasons that are not entirely clear to me um, he, he's just totally incapable of actually putting in any people that, you know, were supportive of his campaign agenda, um, and could, could possibly implement it. I mean, it's, it's been remarkable to watch him appoint, you know, I, I more than I can count at this point, you know, direct senior level appointees who subsequently left to write a scathing book about Trump. And he sort of keeps hiring these people and doing it. And I, you know, part of that is, you know, I, he, he never really had a full concept. It's clear at all of what he was actually trying to do other than sort of win votes. Um, I mean, bait and switch implies actually, I think, uh, a higher degree of subtlety and uh, a more coherent project than he actually is capable of or seems capable of. Um, so with the except when he's appointed some people like Lighthizer on trade, you know, you tend to get some things that are at least directionally with the campaign. But in other cases, you just get this, the kind of conventional Republican agenda. And from what I can tell, he actually has little ability to distinguish between the two at all. So aside, um, I wanted to kind of roll back, I suppose, a bit from Trump specifically, though I'd like to come back to the US election um, a little bit later. But I wanted to talk about your piece in The American Conservative in which you, um, which is included, will include it in the show notes. And in that you characterize the project of American affairs as you see it. And also you kind of uh, give the lay of the land, as it were. And what, I mean, what fascinated me, I suppose, about the piece was that there was, I found so little to disagree with. But I'd go further because it seems to me that the word where you say conservatism in the piece the word conservatism could be substituted with a fair few other political perspectives. You know, you could have replaced it with classical Marxist, um, left populist, particularly in the wake of the defeat of um, Ber or Bernie Sanders' capitulation. You could have substituted it with social democracy. And without changing much else in the piece, 
the argument would still hold um, that the sense you evoke in it of powerlessness and political impotence, the lack of a meaningful social base for politics, the intellectual churning in the midst of social and political decay. Um, I suppose what I'm getting at is um, the diagnosis that you sketch out in that piece is, seems to me to be shared across a wide political spectrum. So what does it mean to be conservative specifically in that context? Well, I, I disagree in one respect, um, which is that I think uh, the even the, the sort of further left or left populist or Marxist um, attitudes or ideologies or coalitions um, cannot be met with the same level of dismissal. Uh, and they, they're, they're not considered evil among the sort of dominant uh, neoliberal, liberal left, whatever you want to call it. They may be considered misguided or impractical. But, but Hillary Clinton, for instance, would not call um, the Sanders people a basket of deplorables. She would say that they want cookies and unicorns or whatever, um, but they're not deplorable. But conservatives can be called deplorable. Uh, and, and they actually sort of revel in that. Um, and that's the one, I, I think, difference uh, in the two groups. And it's why conservatives in particular are the sort of weakest element of, of the sort of ideological constellation that maintains the status quo. And why I suspect that that will be the first to go. And once mm -hmm. that sort of 1960s brand of fusionist conservatism disappears, you will actually, that will be the sort of initial catalyst uh, beginning the realignment that I think is, is uh, quite necessary. Could you just explain what you mean by 1960s fusionist conservatism? Yeah, in the U.S., and it's less true in Europe, although in, in the U.K. maybe it's, it's more similar. But uh, in the U.S., you know, a modern American conservatism really was created, uh, usually dated to around the founding of the National Review in 1955, when basically William F. Buckley and his uh, you know, colleague Frank Meyer and others united what were essentially sort of li libertarians or as they, you know, neoliberals with um, social conservatives, uh, religious conservatives or traditionalists, and then later, you know, sort of Cold War hawks uh, and, and people like that joined as well to make up the canonical Reagan three-legged stool. Um, and more than most even ideological coalitions, uh, the union of libertarians and religious or social conservatives is uh, deeply untenable. And it was held together entirely by the sort of Cold War. Um, and without the existence of, you know, communism to hold it together, uh, it ceased to make a lot of sense, you know, from the 1990s on. And as time went on, the libertarians effectively dominated the policymaking apparatus, um, really pushing in the uh, pushing the U.S. towards, you know, very neoliberal uh, economic policy framework that, you know, has only gained momentum, gained momentum from the 90s through, you know, the 2010s or so. Um, and that is, you know, interestingly, I would say uh, it, it maybe maybe in contrast to myth, you know, in the U.S. it has been it has been kind of the right that is the driving force, because, of course, after after this coalition initially gained success with Reagan, um, it was Clinton um, more than yeah. anyone who really institutionalized yeah. it and, and Obama who did more than anything to preserve it, uh, through the financial crisis. Yeah, that's yeah. really interesting. Um, Julius, it's Alex here. Um, I actually wanted to push you a little bit more on the question of um, how much traction any conservatism could actually have today. Um, but I just want to roll back for a second to, to Phil's question, because I, I mean, I absolutely take your point that left populism um, is probably less lost, as it were, um, than conservatism, because it's more in the cultural mainstream, as, as you point out, you know, as Hillary Clinton would see them as utopian dreamers, but not uh, not as deplorables. Um, but I think that maybe doesn't apply to kind of older ideologies, something like 
classical Marxism, as Phil mentioned, or indeed even uh, classical liberalism, um, for all that, you know, libertarians may feel that they may have some traction in contemporary society. I think a just the growth of, of the state and surveillance and whatever else means that a, a kind of classic liberalism wouldn't have um, wouldn't have traction. But it seems to me, I think, and this I totally agree with your analysis, that conservatism um, fares even worse. Because um, you ask in that American conservative piece, um, you know, about conservatism, who cares? Um, and I'm, I'm kind of tempted to agree. I think one of the most striking things about the contemporary world is precisely the death of tradition. Um, and that any attempt to, I guess, preserve uh, existing or an existing order or existing social structures would be to sustain exactly those forces which undermine tradition. You know, it, that's that is to say, like hyper capitalism or what uh, another conservative described as turbo capitalism. Um, so, I mean, I, with all that in mind, I mean, how what do you see? How do you see your project fitting in with this? Um, do you, how do you navigate in a world completely shorn of, of tradition? That that's um, I'm going to try to big approach question, that a question, from yeah. A, yeah that's a big well I'm going to try to approach it from a different direction um, because in a certain sense I mean there there obviously the, there are traditions uh, around today but you know they don't um, they can't really marshal any any political power um, but I think the the situation is maybe a bit more um, complex than that because the uh, going back to what I said earlier, where um, what you find, I think, and I think what maybe some of the, you know, other, um, call them the, the discarded elements of the left or what you will, um, have discovered is that it's very hard to actually maintain any sort of class solidarity or any sort of economic policy, um, you know, based on equality or or whatever, once you have completely sort of uh, destroyed any sense of uh, political good or common good. Uh, and once you have opened everything up to individualism, uh, you find that, um, you know, it's, it's increasingly difficult to maintain any of these sort of old left commitments, whether it be to the welfare state or to even more disruptive uh, sort of notions of how production should be organized. Uh, and the reality is it's not I don't know that it's so much about preserving tradition as that the the sort of radical liberal individualist project uh, it's it's not tradition that needs to be saved. it's it's the radical liberal individualist project actually undermines itself. Um, it can't maintain any sort of uh, political cohesion. It can't maintain any sort of legitimacy um, and so on. And so it's really dealing with the inevitable, um, collapse or self-destruction of that that we're actually facing. And that's what makes it possible for people who would maybe consider themselves traditionalists and people who would maybe consider themselves classical leftists or, or even, even in some respects classical liberals uh, to sort of unite against what has become this very dehumanizing um, creation of sort of uh, the emancipation of both capital and, and any sort of individual identity and, and so on. I totally take that. I mean, I, I, that the kind of vociferous nature of, of contemporary, like hyper-individualism, um, which actually doesn't even provide a sufficient basis for an actual, any individual flourishing either for that matter. I mean, just in terms of the, the stresses that people are all um, under, you know, um, I mean, with that in mind, I, I, I kind of wanted to ask whether um, you find because I mean, I guess the, the one conclusion one might make from from what hearing what you're describing is that, well, you know, so the only people who are really at home in the modern world, I mean, the modern world, the contemporary world, the contemporary postmodern world is uh, are, are uh, neoliberals. I suppose, right? Um, so, firstly, do you agree with that? And secondly, I mean, my my I, the reason I ask it because my conjecture is kind of even neoliberals. I mean, at least traditional, more more classic neoliberals, I guess, um, rather than the kind of progressive neoliberals that um, are embodied in, let's say, Clintonism, for example. Um, 
are also don't don't might not find themselves totally at home in in this world either um that the appeal of that kind of rugged individualism at least at a discursive level also doesn't really have much purchase in fact people seem more um open for ideas of protection rather than uh you know kind of do pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps so i mean do you think anyone's at home in in the contemporary world basically yeah i absolutely agree um and i think you you see it you you know the if anything the sort of neoliberals are the unhappiest of all um, because all around them, you know, they see they see fascists on the one hand and communists on the other. They see the whole world crumbling. Um, they're deeply unhappy. They're come, you know, they're driven to these wild conspiracy theories on Russia and so on. Um, they know for the most part, you know, it's, it's a, an increasingly smaller and smaller number of them that are actually reaping any economic rewards uh, their children are facing these hyper competitive college pressers. They're likely not going to get as good a jobs as their parents. They're probably living with their parents. Um, you know, the the inertia there is is this, I think, fear that, you know, who, whomever the challengers to the neoliberal order are uh, haven't actually been able to come up with a, you know, a fully fleshed out policy apparatus um, they haven't, you know, demonstrated themselves as more capable stewards on the one hand. On the other, you know, what really holds things together today more than anything is the fiction of this right-left sort of uh, political divide that, of course, is, you know, supersedes everything. And it really is, you know, 1930 again, and it's communism versus fascism. And, mm. you know, you, you got you to gotta post on Facebook and and you know, go out and protest and do all your things rather than actually think about uh, the economic conditions and the sort of underlying issues that are at stake. It's it's fighting over Clinton and Trump and Biden and Trump. I think those um, those are the those are the reasons why neoliberalism maybe still persists in some way in the kind of uh, leading position, though it's an increasingly zombie uh, ideology that itself feels exhausted and under siege in, in all directions. Absolutely. I mean, well, I, 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 although I would defend sustaining the categories of left and right, I, I totally understand that it's difficult to do in contemporary in the contemporary US um, because they seem to have so little purchase or so little uh, like real reference that, that make any sense. Um, Phil? Yeah, I wanted to just before move it, um, uh, I wanted to move on to talk about politics and class more broadly. But just before we do that, I suppose I wanted to push you a little bit further, Julius, because um, if there is no base, you know, with this bleak picture that you portray, if there is no basis for uh, conservatism, conservatism, how are you... It seems to me, you know, what you're what you have, what you're trying to get gesture at is a politics of restoration rather than conserving, because there seems to be that there is nothing, at least from the picture that you portray, there is nothing to conserve. There, there, the possibility for um, restraining or regulating or moderating, modulating change doesn't the capacity doesn't exist to do that. Um, at the same time, as all these traditions have been completely scrambled. So there is no actual politics of conserving. It would seem to be that. So what does it mean to say conservative in that context? Yeah, I don't. I don't think. Um, I don't think conservatism has any future uh, in that sense. I. I think the the question is: Is it possible to create um, a functioning uh, political order that can have? Uh, that can command loyalty uh, and an economic system that, for lack of a better word, works. Um, those are the questions. The extent to which you want to base that on previous forms uh, that and, and you know call that a restoration or some kind of uh, conserving um, rather than a new creation or whatever. Um, you know those might be interesting academic questions. I actually have little little interest in them. I tend to focus more on just the sort of um, more concrete aspects of, of economic policy, of, you know, dealing with, you know, this sort of new economy that's been created uh, out of, you know, very unique intellectual property arrangements and so on. Um, 
dealing with the kind of, uh, you know, dynamics uh, that have that have unfolded as a result of the sort of accumulation of capital uh, and the way the financial industry has been constructed. Um, but, you know, the, in that sense, the questions of conservative or liberal or progressive, um, you know, they're sort yeah. of fun labels, but they don't mean much to me. And I think that given the reality that democratic politics just doesn't mean that much. I'm not going to say it means nothing, but it just means much less than is typically imputed to it. Um, It's these technocratic debates that are going to end up having a bigger impact. And the bizarre thing is that as much as we have sort of talked about technocracy and, and blame technocracy for a lot of failures, which is true in the sense that there is a democratic deficit in a lot of institutions and all of that. But the remarkable thing is that our technocrats are so incredibly unqualified and bad at their specialties. Uh, I mean, you know, these people, most of these people now spend more time fighting on Twitter over, you know, I don't know, some ridiculous slogans or whatever than actually looking at concrete economic problems. So I actually think, you know, especially given my situation and and having, you know, no real means to engage in any kind of mass organization or anything like that, which of course costs, you know, hundreds of millions or billions of dollars in the United States. Um, the real sphere of influence, uh, is on the technocratic level, actually. Uh, it's interesting stuff. Um, so moving then on to the question of politics and class, um, I wanted to talk or dig a little deeper into the piece that you published, um, The Real Class War, in the win- in winter 2019 in American Affairs. Um, and in this piece, I was particularly taken with this claim about the real dynamic of class conflict being intra-elite, um, which is to say uh, struggles between the kind of downwardly mobile um, middle classes and the kind of plutocratic and super rich at the top and that this was much more important dynamic of um, class conflict than a conflict between capitalists and workers and that seemed to me to resonate kind of on a number of levels not least because i wonder if um i wonder if the fact that instead of seeing uh, trump as a kind of uh, portent of a dark fascist future of white supremacist rule and all that that rather perhaps trumpism might have been the last gasp of the so-called white working class of blue collar workers in um, deindustrialized areas of the states and this was their last attempt to um, kind of hold back the political system careering um, beyond anybody's control so you know, I mean, I guess your your piece is built on the assumption that those kinds of voters were already defeated a long time ago. And that seems to me to be, um, you know, that seems to me to be essentially true. So I was wondering if you, anyway, if you could explain the thesis a little more to us that you develop in that piece. Yeah, I, I would actually, I, we get to the same conclusion, um, but I actually look at it in a somewhat different way. I think that, you know, um, the that sort of Midwest uh, industrial or deindustrialized working class is, is probably been, you know, the sort of uh, worst hit um, or and, and first hit uh, group. Um, but the the overall decline of the United States, uh, economic decline, decline in other ways, deindustrialization, all of that, these have, as indeed the piece describes, actually touched on multiple facets of society, including um, large portions of of the elite, or at least what is usually considered the elite. And I think what you actually saw with Trump um, is more a case in which, you know, the the way that the political system has been dominated by donors and so on has actually prevented any serious addressing of these issues, um, you know, for 20 plus years. And Trump is basically, you know, given his weird individual circumstances and what, you know, some might say sociopathic tendencies, his ability to just totally ignore this entire social signaling device that has constrained, you know, political discourse into some kind of neoliberal box. Um, 
is what allowed him to actually address these questions. And it's not so much that, you know, he never actually articulated much in the way of solutions, but he was the first and for a long time the only one who would who would very straightforwardly say, you know, his one of his best lines is, you know, they used to make cars in Michigan and you couldn't drink the water in Mexico. Now they make cars in Mexico. You can't drink the water in Michigan. Um, His open criticism of the Iraq war, even in the Republican primary, is is quite, you know, really full throated, if not, you know, vicious savaging of the George W. Bush administration on a whole host of issues, Um, as well as kind of, you know, openly, openly relishing in kind of the corrupt nature of American politics, talking about how all the politicians come and ask me for money and it's all a joke and all that. And the debates are a joke. You know, he's the only one um, who ever broached these issues. And even though he probably is not particularly sincere about any of these things, and even if he is, doesn't really have the capacity or discipline to implement an agenda and the, and the personnel needed to do it, yeah. um, he brought it up. And and so it's natural, of course, that the the white working class or whatever gravitated to that because they were, you know, among the most um, affected by it. But in general, I I think it's not so much that, you know, he set off on this uh, this this kind of conventional um, political consultant demographic split up the demography kind of situation. I think it's more just the question of all of these issues were out there and no one addressed them. And interestingly, I mean, you know, on a more optimistic note, you know, you're seeing now Biden has, he's made industrial policy a big part of his campaign. He has a whole Buy American program. The Republicans in the Senate picked up on this, you know, several years ago, at least some of them did. Um, These issues were there for a long time. It's just, he was the first one willing to talk about it. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah, I guess if if Trump is a, an illustrative figure in in regard to i guess the relationship of working class to mainstream politics um what about elizabeth warren because you you cite her as an emblematic character for the drift of the middle classes to the left could you explain a little bit more as to how you think her um trajectory embodies this this shift of this group yeah i mean i don't have much to add beyond what i said in the article but i mean her personal history is is at this point, very typical of people in her class where, you know, in the in the 80s or whatever, she's a Republican, you know, professional lawyer, all of that. Um, yeah. And then, you know, she left the Republican Party, I believe, in the Bush administration, uh, the, the second Bush administration, citing a sort of, um, you know, I think kind of the the sort of rhetorical stridency of it, as well as this kind of commitment to extremely shrill libertarian economics. Um, And then, uh, you know, as time has gone on, she's moved, you know, I think further and further left on economic questions relating to financial regulation, redistribution, um, antitrust, uh, and a whole host of other issues. And, uh, Yeah, I I think, you know, as I say in the article, I mean, the interesting part of the whole thing is that the kind of, you know, I don't want to say like the lower tier of the elites because it's actually pretty high up. I would say it's somewhere between kind of the one and 10 percent have actually faced, you know, flattening incomes plus uh, rapidly rising expenses on the things they care about most, namely housing and education. Uh, I, I think weaker job security on a lot of things and and mm. the, the sort of people who were told in the 80s and 90s that they were going to be you know the main beneficiaries of neoliberal uh, of a neoliberal economy and and were in fact for a while all of a sudden finding themselves you know on the wrong end of it uh, and especially because they still have you know unlike the working class they still do have some agency in the political system uh, you know, I think the impact of that is is perhaps, you know, more significant and, and maybe the most significant um, driving force behind a change in politics, which is not to say, of course, that the billionaires don't matter or anything like that. But it's that kind of, uh, you know, lower elite tier that is the sort of fulcrum or the, the main, the, the part of it that's undergoing the biggest shift. Right. No, it, it, it's a very 
influential um, stratum of society, I guess, in on social media and um, ideologically as well. Um, I, I want to actually pick up something, I mean, along similar lines about the radicalization of the middle class um, and maybe use this opportunity to talk a little bit about Black Lives Matter and, and the protests ongoing in, in the U.S. Um, I mean, for me, I, I saw these very much as uh, in a piece that I wrote about it um, about as the triumph of American idealism, um, specifically in relation to the way that the protests, the slogans, uh, their whole kind of interpretive frames um, were adopted wholesale from the U.S. and, you know, imported into anywhere as different as, you know, Denmark or New Zealand um, places, you know, so the, the whole um, theoretical baggage of white privilege or whatever imported to places which don't where it doesn't make any sense, even if, if it even makes sense in, in the U.S. So I maybe mean, I want to take the opportunity to ask you what your take was on it. For me, I haven't. I've have yet to read something truly convincing that explains uh, what stimulated the protests, why, um, why, wh- their intensity. I mean, beyond the obvious and 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 the the the, the terribleness of of uh, police violence and um, that being obviously an ongoing problem, but why they have taken the form that they have. Um, so I wondered if you had had an interpretation of it. Yes, um, I first of all, I read your article. Uh, I, I, I liked right. it a lot for, oh, for whatever you. that's worth. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the, the protests are, are, I mean, there were sort of two predictions I made in that uh, Real Class War article. Um, the first one was that Bernie would lose because, you know, his support only went to like a, actually a fairly small stratum of kind of underemployed uh, college graduates and that sort of thing. And um, there was a lot of, a lot of people didn't like that, but it, it ended up proving to be, Right. Uh, and the second thing, uh, you know, I sort of said is that, you know, that these kind of this class would be the most radical. Um, and what we have seen in the U.S. is a lot of the uh, the sort of protesters who have done the most violence, uh, who are the most radical, um, you know, they end up being, uh, you know, these sort of either young college students or graduates, or actually there's been a, a shocking rash of like corporate lawyers uh, who have been arrested for, you know, lighting police stations on fire and throwing <laughs> Molotov cocktails. And, stuff. and every, you know, uh, a lot of people are shocked by this. But, you know, I, as you know, am not. So um, that's been that's been good for the uh, longevity of the article. Um but more more seriously, I think, you know, certainly the initial protests, the provocation for them, um, you know, I think is is the obvious one. There has been a, you know, it, to me, I would say somewhat surprising persistence of police uh, brutality, uh, you know, misbehavior, whatever you want to call it. Uh, and initially, I think the protests were um, strictly focused on that, um, but they very quickly uh, became, you know, again, kind of hijacked by a lot of these, uh, sort of, you know, professional managerial class elements who turned them into, you know, in the direction of a much larger culture war. And, and also one that where you see in a lot of cases, like the defund the police stuff ends up, um, you know, meaning turning things over to consultants uh, to design new programs or, you know, hiring social workers, particularly, you know, sort of university educated social workers rather than kind of, you know, uh, more working or middle class police, stuff like that. Um, you know, I think that that phenomenon is not fully known yet, but, you know, it seems to definitely be going in a very predictable direction. What I Mm. thought was most, I mean, initially, I mean, I think if we're going to be very sort of realistic about this and and maybe materialistic about it, um, the real antagonism in these protests is actually between what you might call, for lack of a better word, the far left um, or maybe kind of a a proletarian left of one kind or another with the sort of centrist neoliberal gentry left. Um, Because fundamentally, and this goes for coronavirus too, I mean, it's it's if you if you do have this increase in crime, which is what we are actually seeing now uh, and, and rioting and so on, this urban core commercial real estate is the main casualty. And for the most part, that's all owned by, you know, your typical rich 
uh, nominally progressive, good democratic voter uh, elite uh, element. Um, and so initially, the I thought these protests would be most promising if they really set up a an actual conflict between you know the the sort of activists uh, and the sort of nominal progressives. But mm -hmm. as has happened uh, every time, um, basically the conservatives come in uh, and they you know say a lot of dumb things or you know they send in their security you know. The, in this case, the federal federal law enforcement, and so on and so on, uh, to allow the sort of gentry left to go to the activist left and say, "See, we're not so bad. We're good." Um, <laughs> yeah, and and re reconsolidate uh, along the old sort of um, lines and and ward off any more serious political confrontation. Uh, and you're and it's it's going to be very interesting, actually, too, because for the last I don't know twenty thirty years. You know, the exciting parts of uh, of the U.S. or, you know, New York and the cities and San Francisco. And with the combination of coronavirus and the protests, um, these cities are going to find themselves in pretty dire straits. Uh, commercial real estate is going to fall precipitously. Residential real estate is going to fall considerably. Anybody, you know, who doesn't want to pay those taxes has already left. Uh, and because they can work, you know, remotely, they're not going to do it. We've seen a number of announcements of companies moving to Texas and so on. Um, so much like has taken place on this sort of individual level with the, you know, professional class and so on, you may begin to see it at a kind of larger geographic level where, you know, New York ends up, you know, it's a, it's a diminishing tax base of sort of gentry liberals facing off against a, an emboldened activist left. That the gentry left really has no capacity to refuse demands to, uh, and the only question is whether the conservatives will come in and bail them out. <laughs> it's um, I love the I love the analysis in terms of the shifting dynamics of uh, urban cores, and I think I'm, I mean I'm sure you're onto something there. There's a slightly different, um, I think there's a slightly different dynamic to what explains the particular intensity of BLM here in the UK, or at least, I mean, it's uh, my my view, my perspective on it, which is how far it's shaped by the politics of Brexit and how far it's shaped by the um, if defeat, effectively, of the professional middle classes that they endured over Brexit and then the election of the Tory government in 2019, and that this is uh, an expression, essentially, of their political anger and frustration and impotence is taken out on inanimate objects. And I wanted to, um, I wanted to ask your view on Brexit, um, both in general, but also specifically because it seems to cut against your... Uh, your point about the powerlessness of um, the working class across the Western world, um, because it is striking that despite of the fact that the working class in the UK um, has suffered from many of the same kind of ravages that we, uh, you've described and discussed in the US, uh, political alienation, deindustrialization, and even uh, you know even now we see in the statistics the emergence of the deaths of despair phenomenon, which has been so widely discussed um, uh, among uh, the U among the U.S. working class. Nonetheless, despite this, um, so-called red wall red wall voters in the north of England, in particular, they smashed the Labour one party state there. They voted the Tory party into office, and they've effectively laid the ground for a new cross class coalition in British politics. And that seems to me to suggest a, a continuing capacity on the part of the working class to shape politics in a major Western country in a significant way. At least, you know, that's my take. But I'd like I'd be curious to, to see how you uh, to Well, if you could tell us how you see things from the other side of the pond. Yeah, well, I mean, if, if anything, I would say that um, the UK is even in even worse shape than the United States, which is uh, impressive. Um, but. I, I, again, as I say in the article, I, it's you know the the one thing that the working class can do is vote, um, and that's that's not meaningless, and it creates the sort of base condition for a lot of this intense elite conflict. Um, but what they can't do is actually shape the direction 
that Brexit will sort of take in, a, in any meaningful way. They're not going to be really negotiating the, uh, the trade agreements. Uh, they're not going to be deciding whatever the new um, economic strategies are, uh, yeah. that sort of thing. Um, that's, that's sort of my basic point. It's, you know, I mean, it's telling, it, it is important that there is that enough discontent to allow for kind of elite challenges to the status quo to, to gain, to, to gain the strength to the level where they are. I mean, you could contrast that with, for example, in the nineties or whatever you had, um, Pat Buchanan and Ross Perot, you know, running, you know, what you could call Trump like campaigns and they went nowhere because at the time, I, you know, people were still uh, willing to believe, I think, the sort of end of history dream and things were still sort of seemed to be on the surface good enough uh, that th those campaigns just never got any traction. Um, I mean, my view of Brexit in general, when, you, when it comes to actually shaping the policies that will determine it, is that, you know, from what I can tell, and I'm, I'm only an outsider, but... Um, you know, the people that are in charge of Brexit have no idea, it seems to me, what Brexit is actually for or could be used for. I mean, the point to me of doing Brexit would be for the United Kingdom to have the freedom to pursue its own industrial policy. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and potentially, you know, if it wanted to, to reorient itself maybe a bit more around the kind of old British empire as opposed to being a sort of vassal of Germany and continental Europe. But uh, that that second one is probably a uh, you know a can only follow from the first one, and for the most part, the Tory party in the UK, uh, at least the parts of it that I'm aware of, don't seem particularly interested in or capable of understanding what it takes uh, to do that sort of industrial policy that Brexit makes possible. Yeah. And then, of course, the you know elements of the Labour Party and the left in Britain uh, do, um, but of course. For cultural and other reasons, they are hesitant about Brexit, or at least they were, and, and now seem to be just totally disorganized. Yeah, no, it's it's a, I think it's a highly accurate reading. Um, and it's between that kind of, it's the breakdown between those two forces that mean the political system is so sclerotic and unable to kind of resolve the, uh, both unable to seize the opportunities of Brexit, like you say, but also unable to resolve the actual problems confronting it directly. Um, so to, uh, I guess, to draw us towards our final set of um, questions we wanted to talk with you about is they're specifically on US decline. And I know Alex has a question here about the Republican Party, so I'll turn over to him. Yeah, I mean, I, I really enjoyed some of the lines, uh, Julius, that you put in uh, your writing about, uh, you know, kind of withering critiques of the Republican Party, its donor base. Um, I, I mean, I, I love the one that you say that, you know, that they, they're just too, that the most of the donor base for the Republicans is just too dumb to realize that, that the Democrats provide a better image laundering service. Um, actually, so much, in fact, I think we included that, we, we quoted that in the end of the end of history book uh, that uh, that should be coming out soon. Um how do you see the Republican Party evolving in, in that light? Because, I mean, you, it, not only is it kind of plutocratic, but it's kind of a particularly decrepit plutocratic sort of uh, um, sort of structure, um, but wedded to it kind of some kind of working class or, you know, provincial petty bourgeois support. Um, so, you know, like, for example, Bannon talks about making it a working class party, which um, I, I mean, I personally don't buy. Um, what do you what do you how do you see its its evolution going, especially because um, unlike in Europe, I mean, the American party system is so wedded to, to the state, it's not going to uh, kind of decline of its own accord because, um, yeah, I mean, it's it's so institutionalized, I guess, in the, in the way that it works. So, yeah, what next for the Republican Party, which is a question we've never really asked on this podcast. So, yeah, yeah. Um... Well, uh, I wish I wish I knew the answer for you. Um, I, I think in general, you know, the Republican Party, there's there's two sets of donors. Some of them are just never going to change. Um, and, you know, that's they have funded irrelevant, you know, vastly overfunded, but totally irrelevant institutions for years. And they will continue to do so. Um there's, and, and by the way, neither of these sets actually wants to make it a working class party. Uh, and, and I don't, you know, Steve Bannon uh, is another one, a sort of the guy at the end of the bar who says something interesting from time to time, but at the end of the day, he has no idea how to do anything. <laughs> um, and, you know, um, 
But the other set of, of Republican donors is actually, uh, they're, they're more motivated either by sort of religious issues um, or kind of uh, what you might call nationalism, and in particular in this context, competition with China. And they actually do recognize the decline. And even if they don't particularly like a lot of the, you know, sort of uh, left-wing kind of economic analysis and that sort of thing, they are very interested in sort of industrial policy and technological policy and even shoring up uh, the weaker end of the labor force uh, as a matter of competing with China. So my guess is actually the way the future looks um, is something where you, you don't have any grand compromises and no one, you know, wakes up one day and just says, you know, oh, American affairs is right about everything. We're just going to do that. Um, although that would be nice. But um, <laughs> it's more likely that, you know, much like, you know, you had Clinton neoliberals and Bush neoliberals and they hated each other. And they were constantly fighting about uh, all kinds of minutia, but fundamentally they were going in the same direction on political economy issues like trade and taxes and welfare and many other things. Um, I think you'll have, uh, you know, it over time. It's you know you'll have a Republican Party that will want to do industrial policy for sort of defense reasons, and you'll have a Democratic Party that wants to do it for, um, you know, environmental or. Uh, welfareist type of reasons. And um, in classic American fashion, we will sort of do both. Uh, and that, I think, is the optimistic case anyway. If that doesn't happen, then, you know, I think it's, uh, uh, it's well, I don't know what it looks like, but it's bad. Yeah, I mean, yeah, to kind of tendential decline continuing. Um, I get one aspect of decline that I guess you've, you've uh, drawn attention to um, is the fact that uh, the American elite, especially the American political leadership, is a bunch of old white guys, and, and not just in the, specifically in the sense of uh, them being guys, um, because they're not exclusively guys, they're, but, uh, but more that they're old. Um, so the kind of uh, gerontocracy of, of the United States um, is um, bears comparison with, with the late Soviet Union, um, which is a point that you make. Um, I think, as you put it, you know, most of the U.S. Le leadership is too old to drive on a busy highway and yet are obviously entrusted with the reins of the state. Um, it's actually funny because I shared that article a little uh, a little while ago, if you win, it, when it came out, um, and someone re tried to rebut it by by going, "Oh, well, this is just another piece attacking old people," <laughs> which obviously is a misreading of of the article. But it obviously spoke to a certain sensitivity um, about the kind of well, effectively about the cult of youth today, um, and that that cult of youth often manifests itself as you know, kind of uh, sneering at older generations and old people as as people who just kind of should shove off and get out of the way, you know, kind of the okay boomer meme and whatnot. Um, so my, the, the thing I'm trying to tussle with, and maybe you can, you know, help us out with this is how do you mediate between the fact of a gerontocracy and the overweening contemporary cult of youth at the same time, which uh, predominates uh, contemporary culture? Yeah. Um, well, in this case, that's fairly simple because the uh, the baby boomers are the ones most obsessed with the cult of youth. Um, they just can't admit that they're old. Um, but I started noticing the generational divide actually shortly. At, you know, when I started American Affairs, I actually started going around talking to different groups about politics. And I never actually thought generational sort of uh, classifications were, you know, meaningful in any important way. But increasingly, it became clear that, um, you know, regardless of the background of the person I was talking to, you know, were they Democrat, Republican, right, left, um, you know, income, race, whatever, uh, age ended up being often the biggest predictor of whether we could have a good conversation or not. And even if we didn't agree on, you know, policies or whatever, we typically, you know, with people under, I don't know, 45, 50, whatever you want to call it, um, there was, a, you know, a sense of what the major problems were. Uh, but once you got into older, you know, demographics, like it was just impossible to have like a meaningful conversation. Uh, and I think in the U S these issues are probably more acute, um, than other, than other countries perhaps just because the, the differences are so stark. I mean, if you, if you came of age, you know, in the seventies, eighties, you know, your big memories are the defeat of the Soviet union the sort of Reagan economic boom, 
the the revitalization of cities like New York, whereas people of you know my generation are around there. It's the Iraq War, the Great Recession, student loans, you know, massive incarceration, uh, city real estate being way too expensive, all that stuff. And then on top of that, you have the national trajectory, which went from, you know, total unipolar superpower in 1990s to now where, you know, I, I don't know if you saw it, um, a person I've met once or twice, Eris Rusinos, wrote this amazing thing yeah. and unheard about how the U.S. <laughs> is just, a, you know, you, who could have imagined that being written in 1992? Impossible. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I think it's, you, you have to look, you know, and anyone who's not a boomer is gonna, has to look at the boomers and be like, you know, look what you did. Um, so I think that just sharpens the generational issues even, even more dramatically, but it's definitely real, uh, in this country. And even if you, I mean, even at a practical level if sort of every, if every college professor over the age of 65 retired, that would have just a remarkable impact on the whole economic, you know, uh, chain. And, and all of a sudden Gen Xers would move up and the millennials yeah. would move up. Yeah. Uh, it would, it would go an incredibly long way actually to, to diffusing a lot of, a lot of tensions. Um, but, uh, yeah, I, you know, again, I, I hate, you know, you don't want to paint with too broad a brush, but the boomer culture just is in, in totally resistant to that. I mean, every article or every response I got to that article, by the way, from, you know, it was all from people who were like, I'm 72 and I can drive just fine. <laughs> like, they, they never, there was never anything like, well, I think it would be bad for society for these reasons. Like there was no reasoning like that. It was just like, no, I'm healthy. You're young yeah. and stupid. Shut up. You know, it's very toxic for some reason. Uh, Aris is uh, actually a local because he lives in Kent and is indeed my PhD student, one of my PhD students. So I know Aris well. Um, and uh, the piece is a great one, as you say. It's uh, And like you say, it's timely and could not have conceivably been written at any other time, I think, maybe even since 1945. Um but anyway, uh, one final inevitable question, Julius, uh, which is, um, who are you going to vote for, and who do you think is going to win in November? Two questions, well, in fact. Yeah, I, 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 you know, absolutely refuse to, uh, you know, uh, give endorsements <laughs> or anti-endorsements. <laughs> uh, and you know, in America, we have this great thing with nonprofits where they can't, you know, in, enter into political discourse. So I get to hide behind that. <laughs> um, I think, I mean, the question of who's going to win, uh, first off, of course, I don't claim to be good at predicting these things and I don't really study polls or anything like that. And I didn't think Trump would win in 26 times, 2016 either. Um, that said, if you ask me my guess, I mean, I think it will be very difficult for Trump to win reelection. I, I think Biden is the favorite. And I say that mainly because, Trump is just running as a conventional Republican at this point. He really doesn't have, uh, you know, all of the kind of interesting elements of his 2016 campaign are mostly gone, yeah. uh, except for trade, which is frankly too wonky at this point for anyone to get real excited about. Um, what the campaign has sort of tried, what they're doing is they're making it, you know, um, uh, you know, the, the Democrats, the left, they're so radical they're going to tear down every statue. There's going to be riots in every city. Uh, Trump is your last line of defense against that, which does work against or among a sort of, you know, very partisan kind of, you know, Republican kind of people that are interested in that kind of intellectual current and the party activists. I don't know if it's going to have enough sway, frankly, outside that group. Uh, and I don't, you know, in this case, Biden's, um, what would be the delicate phrase, you know, sort of elderly persona uh, benefits him because he's just a nothing. I mean, he, he doesn't, it's hard to view him as particularly threatening yeah. in any, in any way at all. So yeah. I, I, you know, unless he literally no corn collapses. It, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and to be honest with you at this point, Biden is actually funnier and more entertaining than Trump. Perhaps not intentionally, <laughs> uh, but yeah. you know, I mean, the you know the stories about the record player and like you never know what he's going to say. It's entertaining. <laughs> yeah. um, he's a great he's a great storyteller uh, of, you, of a very specific genre. 
yeah, it's just you can't really it's hard to sort of look, you know, see that as this fearsome threat that the Republicans are going to try to make it. So I think unless he, you know, really does collapse on stage or, you know, really, really shows a tendency to elevate like, you know, the craziest elements of the so-called left that uh, I think he's, you know, it's his election to lose. Yeah, so I guess in, in the in the election of Brezhnev versus Brezhnev, you're voting for Brezhnev then, so we can conclude. <laughs> exactly. Very good. <laughs> Very good. That was really good, and I think uh, I think our listeners will appreciate it because it's um, not least because you know we've uh, shared your material and we've talked about your material in the past, and so I think it'll be, I think they'll be interested to hear what you have to say. And I have to, you know, again, it's striking because I, you know, I find most I very I find there's very little to disagree with um, the specific points you just made. You know, I tend to agree with most of what you said. Yeah, well, um, like I said, I'm a, I'm a fan of the podcast. I I listen to. Uh, uh, most of the episodes, at least, I really impressed with your speaker and topic selection. So uh, oh, happy great. to do be helpful in any way that uh, I Cheers. can. Thank you. Uh, it's been fantastic, Julius. Thank you very much for joining us. Mm-hmm.